So uh, thanks at first for, for being here. And I want to introduce you uh, to you some um, ideas we have at Deutsche Börse for building a digital infrastructure for digital assets. And I will start with a looking back at the history. And if you look back at the history, um, we had already technological um, revolutions in capital markets. Yeah? And if you look quite back a while, so 100 years ago, um, the securitization itself, so making assets tradable at all, was something that was back then a, re a revolution. Yeah? Something which was not possible before. And what we've seen then was there was a hype, so to say. Then this hype crashed in the 30s. And so people said, oh, it's dangerous to trade. Yeah? So we saw this technological movement was something where people yeah, figured out how to deal with it. Then we had a hype, we had a crash, and then we stabilized this. And we saw that this was something that helped overall global economy grow and distribute capital in an efficient manner. But then another technology came. And these technology were electronic trading systems. And these electronic trading systems that occurred in the 80s and then later on in the 90s grew further and further were something that replaced the physical trading floor. So we saw here a revolution as well. There was again a hype. Some of you may have participated in it back in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, of the 21st century. And then we saw that it got stabilized and ultimately completely replaced the physical trading floor. And right now, we are only used to electronic trading at all. And now what we believe at Deutsche Börse is that there will be another revolution, yeah, which is really completely a replacement of the existing infrastructure ultimately. And this will be digital securities and the digital infrastructure for capital markets. So digital will replace electronic. But yet, I don't know the picture. I don't know how this will look like. But what I want to give you is an idea, and that's the main part of the whole presentation, to be honest, how we think this could look like in future and how this could work in a distributed manner. So uh, what you can see here is, is a picture that we have in mind how the capital markets of the future might look like. What you can see here are, are computers that are uh, symbolic for nodes, so to say, or wallets, if you want to have it like that. So you have a network where you have inside financial institutions that are directly connected with each other. Yeah, we know this from the distributed world. To be honest, we think that this, in the, the correct environment in the capital market space, and I'm not talking about crypto assets here, I'm really talking about existing instruments on the new technology, so securities, money, and so on and so on. The, the right framework for that is a protected network. It's not a network that's completely open. We know there's the analogy to uh, 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 internet, yeah, when we talk about DLT a lot, where people almost say, oh, you only need an open protocol and then you can trade on it. And I just had a discussion like yesterday with somebody uh, around that. And I think this is simply not true, because if you look at financial institutions and financial networks right now, SWIFT, Target2, T2S, and so on and so on, these are all protected and closed networks. These are not open networks. So for financial assets that are already being regulated, we believe that this future will have a protected network. So that's the, the blue um, uh, frame that you see. And then you have something which is represented by locks here on this picture. And this is what's currently being highly discussed as the custody function. And the custody function for us is actually not only the safekeeping of private keys. That's far too easy. First observation in the market is that there are currently, to to largest extent, almost only solutions that are protecting private keys for crypto assets at most cryptocurrencies. And many people in the market for years didn't see the need for a dedicated custody solution for digital securities or existing instruments, especially on permissioned networks, because they believed that the permissioned network itself is protection enough to trade securities on this network. I don't think so. I think this is not true. It's not enough. The custody function is actually more than just the key management, but it's the access management. It's also the administration of access management. We currently have in the industry lists of people who are allowed to trade, for example, or to issue securities. We have to have this in the new world as well. 
And we have to make sure that the integrity of this network is being protected. Because whatever is being issued on this network, every other participant in the network has to believe that it was correctly issued into this network. So the integrity of the network is the highest value in this approach. And for that reason, you have to make sure that people that are really only allowed to do this can access and do transactions within this network. And this is like only the, the easier picture, so to say. If you look at it in a more visionary way, how things could evolve, we think about how we can integrate this new kind of infrastructure into the existing world and especially into the existing distribution channels. We have seen as well many approaches in the industry where they think that they can build completely new infrastructure on DLT that is completely re replacing existing systems. From our perspective, this does not make sense. And why is this the case? I think this is a kind of a filter bubble problem. We as like more DLT, DLT aficionados are uh, maybe more keen to download separate apps to trade digital securities and stuff like that because we simply like the topic. If, if I look at my father and his custody account at his custody bank, he doesn't want to download an additional app to trade anything digital. Where does he want to have the digital security? Just beneath his regular security in a, as a position in his bank account, in his custody account, with an ISIN. He doesn't care if it's digital or not. He only cares if it's faster or cheaper. That's the only reason why he would trade digital security. Not because it's digital. It should be better. It should provide value. And so we believe for a very long time the distribution channels will stay completely the same in the financial industry. And whatever kind of digital asset you want to trade, if you want to reach mass adoption, I think you have to get it into the accounts of the custody banks to reach the private clients. Yes, a world of direct investment between retail clients is possible in the far off future, but for mass market adoption and to get the, really the people on the streets, you have to give them the assets where they keep them, and they keep them with their bank. And so what we will in the future try to provide is that we provide integration functionalities for these networks into the banks. So they can directly connect their position keeping, their account keeping systems with these networks. And then what you can do is you can synchronize the account with what is being kept on the wallet. And what you can do there is even, now looking a bit more into the future, you don't only have one node per bank or one node per financial institution, but instead you can replicate a nodes, uh, the, the account structure of the banks with the node structure on chain. So, you, so that you have one wallet or one node per client that is exactly reflecting the same account in the account keeping system of the bank in a way that it can be directly synchronized. And then you have this direct connectivity between retail clients, but only in the back office. So in the front office, in the, in the, in the touch points of the clients, they still have their banking account, but in the back office you can directly trade securities between to individual retail clients, even amongst different institutions. And this will reach, ultimately, the efficiency gains that we hope come from the technology, but in the back office. And then, my father would also buy the security because it's simply cheaper and much faster. And then, of course, what you can do is not only put securities onto this network, but you, of course, put, as well, commercial bank money on this network, commercial bank money issued by different institutions, commercial bank money issued in different currencies, and maybe ultimately even central bank money as well in a digital form onto this network. And then what happens next is that these assets become interchangeable within one protected network. This means you have a DVP between securities and commercial bank money. You have a PVP, so you have FX trading inside. And you even have maybe new kind of asset classes as we assume them to grow. So for example, of course, then Bitcoin, but as well things like Libra. And this will be all like, kept in this network that is changeable and intertradable with, uh, with each other, but connect into the legacy world from the distribution perspective in a way that even my father would have the Bitcoins, the digital securities, the Libra or the digital money on his bank account. So just some thoughts how the future could look like. And then I would also spend some time on uh, the regulatory movements that we've seen, as Philip has already indicated before. 
And I want to uh, focus on the German level and on the EU level because I think for us here as this market, this, these are the most relevant movements that we have seen. Back a year ago, we already had seen two things. First, a uh, blockchain strategy by the uh, German government, which already included a way forward with regard to digital securities. And second, the so-called crypto Verwahrgesetz, so the German uh, change in the, in, the, in the credit law with regards to crypto custody. And what we have additionally now is a draft bill for electronic securities, which right now, at the first time in, in German history, allows the dematerialization of securities. Until now, we still had matri material securities. Yeah? So this clearly changed. And especially the draft bill for electronic securities is something that is really interesting because you have both the possibility to issue securities on a central register and a decentral register. Both need a registrar function. Yeah, this is where we can use the experience that we have in other markets to provide services as well. And we think that it's a great step forward in terms of dematerialization in general, but as well to enable really securities being put on DLT systems um, but why are these decentral registers? And then we see something, and by the way, on the timeline, this electronic security law is something that is much quicker than the EU stuff, because we assume that this could be already ratified uh, within uh, the beginning of next year, and then this will already be demanded by our clients, so therefore we need something rather on the short term than on the long term. If you look now onto the European level, there are two movements that are quite interesting, and I will come to that in a second in detail. You have the, um, the, the um, regulation on um, markets and crypto assets, short MICA. This regulation is caring about all assets that are non-financial instruments after MIFID II. So the, the distinction line between the, the MICA regime and the other one, the pilot regime for DLT market infrastructure, is the definition of financial instruments after MIFID II. So this includes, for example, utility tokens, private stable coins, stuff like that. It's, a, it's a, a, a bucket, so to say, of any type of crypto assets that's not a MIFID II instrument. And for the MIFID II instruments, you have the regulation um, of the pilot regime on DLT market infrastructures. But to be realistic, this is something which will be implemented within three years. So it's not something where you can start building stuff tomorrow and then have something productive next year, because this will take time to be ratified. But it's a EU regulation, so that means that every state within the EU has to, apply, has to uh, comply with that. So you already have the whole European market. And then I want to just remember maybe that this is part of a broader perspective. Yeah? It's part of the digital financial package of the EU, and we do not have to forget that there are some goals that could conflict with each other. So, Okay, I have five minutes, I can do that. Yeah. So um, part of this digital financial package is, for example, that we still have a harmonized market within Europe. We have the approach of capital market union ongoing besides all the technological stuff. What I see as a risk right now is that with the new technology, there will be a technological market fragmentation. So we have to take care that we do not fragment the market in a technological way in order to risk the capital market union. There's, for example, still a demand for operational resilience. If we have now multiple different uh, 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 market infrastructures growing, the risk is, I think, that the uh, regulatory uh, uh, bodies, so for example, ESMA or EBA, will have high efforts to, to make sure that all market infrastructures provided within the EU and under these licenses operate in a resilient way. And if we risk operational resilience by just having new technology, this is something which will also lead uh, to, to uh, not fostering the idea of DLT in the capital markets. So just two ideas. And one slide that I still want to repeat, even though I know that I've shown it, uh, it before previously, is also where we look into the future and maybe looking at the possibilities of DLT more from a securitization perspective than a tokenization perspective, but leading to similar results. So if you look at the possibilities of the development of capital markets. Right now, in the pre-trade, we still have manual market making, we have single issuance in the trading, and we have still partially manual integration in the back office. What we could do with already existing technology is already good enough to move a step forward, by the way. So in the mid-future, you could already start having issuance platforms that have an issuance program that's standardized, already possible today. 
you could start based on these standardized issuance processes to do more often also continuous issuance, something which we could do today. And you could already do settlement via application programming interfaces, already possible with today's technology. But now let's look a bit into the future, what could be possible with the next step of technology, with DLT. You have an integration by assets, so you have many asset classes on one network, as I've shown before, and that makes it possible to make assets interchangeable. In the trading side, you could do automated bots because the investment decision for a company is too short term to have it being decided by a human. And what you could do here is even say, what is the purpose of the refinancing? The purpose of the refinancing is to provide the primary industry with money. So if BMW wants to produce cars, they issue security to have money to produce the cars. But what we could do in the future, if you have this kind of infrastructure, you connect it to the data warehousing of BMW, and if BMW gets an order for one BMW, then the security is being issued that is taking care of the refinancing of exactly this car. And as you know already, what you have to uh, pay to each pre-producer for this specific car, you can one-to-one -one connect this to the cash flows of the security. So this is a future that is possible not only with tokenization, but with securitization. And this is kind of interesting. But what you need to do is... Hello? You, you have to... I'm um, done. Yeah, one right. sentence. Thanks. Okay. So you need to prepare for that because you see the regulation ongoing. And we are very happy to collaborate. Just contact us. Many thanks.